Welcome to Fuzzy Butts and Friends. Well, as much as it drives Fuzzy Butts all over this big old world of ours, absolutely crazy when they hear me say it. I am the host of this show, your big dog, Luke Robinson. And we're happy again to have back with us this week. She's feeling a lot better. She's our co-host uh, and also our co-producer of this show, Ginger Morgan. She's also the director of the Puppy Up Foundation. Ginger, how are you? I am doing well, and I'm glad I am well. It's glad to have my voice at least back by 90%. Every once in a while, it might squeak, or I may sound like very deep voice and sound like you, but I'm glad to be back. <laughs> it is. I got to tell you, uh, Dr. Hame Modiano and I had a wonderful uh, podcast together. We we went long. We had so much to talk about. He was a wonderful guest, but I got to tell you, it just changes the dynamic not having you here. So you brighten up the Aww. show. You brighten up the show, and you certainly do represent. Uh, you know me. I nerd out and talk about data a lot, but but uh, you you bring really the heart. I think to of the show, and I sort of bring the the. The brain. The nerd part. Oh, oh. The yeah. brain part. Okay. <laughs> the, the I nerd. thought you meant the nerd part. <laughs> but but also here today, uh, here on the show with us on this episode, Ginger, uh, also has a very heartwarming story uh, to talk about and to share with our audience, uh, is Teresa Ryan. She is a, uh, a New York Times uh, bestselling author. Uh, I think a couple of times she's written a ton of books about uh, the value of companions in her life. Uh, and she's also world renowned. Teresa, welcome to Fuzzy Butts and Friends. Thanks. I'm glad to be here. Thank you. It's great to have you. Well, we always like to start out the show, uh, Fuzzy Butts and Friends, with Fuzzy Butts. So I don't think you have any Fuzzy Butts in your uh, where you're at right now. But uh, uh, what Fuzzy Butts uh, do you have right now in your world? In my world, I do not. I'm in my law office right now, and they do come to work with me sometimes, but not today. Um, I currently have three. I almost always have beagles, so I have three beagles. One's a one's a mix. Um, so the, our oldest one is Ro, and he is a retired hunting dog. We did not use him as hunting. The hunter died. His um, wife didn't really care for the dog and left him chained up in the backyard and just kind of threw kibble at him until a wonderful neighbor talked her into at least turning the dog over to a rescue. And then I found him a week later at the rescue and I was fostering him. Well, was I know all ago. about fostering. Mm -hmm. I do a lot of fostering. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I fostered him, um, of course, fell in love and we kept him. And then our, and he's about 14 now. And then we have uh, Percival. Percival is about, he'll be 12 in June. He is also a beagle. He was rescued from, um, he was rescued by Beagle Freedom Project from a laboratory where they test on animals. So he spent the first 18 months of his life in a laboratory being tested on. We don't know what they did, uh, what kind of test, but we do know they cut his vocal cords and he has a tattoo in his ear from whatever testing was done on him. Um, but he's fine now. He doesn't remember any of that. He's the most lovable, friendly, outgoing dog you'll ever see. It's kind of amazing, actually, that he would ever trust humans again. And he's, like I said, he'll be 12 in June. And then we have Poppy. And Poppy is, um, Poppy came, was also rescued by Beagle Freedom Project, but she came from China. She was rescued from the dog meat trade just before she was probably maybe 10 months old. Um, and she, uh, she was brought over from China and pretty much feral, um, not used to people or anything else and not trusting or whatnot. And we, we got her DNA tested. So we do know she is 70% um, Beagle. And then the other parts are Shih Tzu and Pekingese. And oh, no. She looks absolutely nothing like either one of those breeds. Um, so clearly she got her attitude from those breeds because she now believes she is a princess. She is royalty and she has, she has recovered nicely. Still not crazy about strangers. Takes her a little while to warm up, but who can blame her? So. Well, well, well. I used to, um, I used to be the executive director for the Humane Society here in Memphis and we got a beagle in and she was older when we got her and she had been hanging out for years and years at um, this facility. Uh, let's see the drain, the drain maintenance department for the uh, 
city. And the guys just fed her. She had some puppies. I mean, this whole thing. And then some, something happened. She hurt her leg. She may have gotten in an accident or something. Then they, they brought her to me. But let me tell you something. I fell in love with her. I did let her get adopted out. But that girl had some type of an attitude. I mean, she, the of personality. <laughs> she, you know, she had to go back and forth to the, the vet so many times and our cruelty investigator would take her. And any time when she came in, I, I also didn't have any room for her in the kennel. So she lived in my office. But and every time he would come in my office, she would just look at him and then turn her, turn her back to him and wouldn't like and just face the wall like, no, you don't exist. Right. This is not happening. <laughs> this is, yeah, this is not happening. I'm not going with you. She was so funny. They're very smart dogs, but they're full of personality too. Yeah. So. We had the uh, the founder, and uh, I apologize if I forgot her name, of the uh, Beagle Freedom Project here on Fuzzy Butts and Friends. And Shannon Keith. Shannon, Shannon, that's exactly right. I apologize, <laughs> Shannon. My, I'm just horrible at names. I've got you. Anyway, we... It was just, but it was such a powerful and ginger. I, I think you probably would agree. Probably the the most painful, um, yeah. but powerful podcast that we've done. And uh, but it was so educational. Um, I didn't know anything about the the meat trade, um, the overseas meat trade. Didn't know that's what it was called. There was an industry. Um, I had yeah. an idea, but certainly didn't know it was that robust. And and just God bless you for for rescuing um, Percival and Poppy. And uh, Roe as well, but uh, but uh, uh, just the, to hear that Percival is doing well, and uh, yeah. like you said, he doesn't seem to have any memories, um, uh, or, or at least uh, any long term damage um, um, from that. Um, is the same true of Poppy? Is she okay? Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, they're both. I mean, you wouldn't necessarily know how traumatized they were. Like I said, Poppy's still a little um, skeptical of strangers. You know, she'll bark and she needs you to sit down when she meets you. She doesn't like people standing up over her. But we, um, she was also kind of our pandemic dog. So we didn't get as much socializing as we might otherwise have. We got her just just about a year before the pandemic. So just about when we got her used to us and we're starting to take her out and kind of get her a little more socialized, the pandemic happened and we couldn't anymore. So she's she's probably about five now. Um, you know, we don't know their exact age. First of all, it's the only one we know his exact age because you get the medical, you know, you get the records. So we know his birthday is June 4th and he'll be 12. But and Percival, he doesn't, yeah, even the vocal cords, they kind of grow back after a while. So not, it, he doesn't, he doesn't certainly sound like he would if they had never done that, but he's got some volume to him. Just ask our name. <laughs> he's got some volume to him now. So he worked around it and he had, um, you know, we, like I said, you don't get to know what tests were done on them. So, you know, or if he was in the placebo group or what control group, but um, pretty sure he wasn't. But when we first got him, any kind of beeping noise would send him just terrified off to the furthest corner he could get to. He would be drooling. He would be shaking. So like, you know, um, like the a beeping noise that a, a truck will make when it's backing up, that would set him off. Um, I'm not that great of a cook. So the smoke alarm would set him off. And we found that out the hard way, <laughs> you know, or even the beeping, like if the battery is going bad and the smoke alarm, that would just terrify him. But he's he's over that. That lasted a couple of years. Um, but we've had him eight and whoa no, we've had him ten years now. Um, so he's he's fine. You would you would never guess it. Um, the well, group got he got rescued with, there were eleven of them. He was the ninth rescue that um, Beagle Freedom Project had ever done. And so a long time ago, <laughs> ten years ago, um, and that whole group of beagles that got rescued, every one of them gets car sick. So there must have been something going on, some reminder being in there. So, well, yeah. one of the one of the most uh, I think heartbreaking um, uh, facts that I learned from our conversation with Shannon was that I had always thought, Teresa, that 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 beagles were selected for scientific reasons because they are a much better model scientifically. Um, but what Shannon says, no, it's just their personality. They're just so docile and they're so sweethearted um, and and submissive, I guess. And eager to please. Yeah, yeah. You're eager to please. And that's just, oh, it's tough. And thank thank her for what she does. And yeah. it's a yeah. wonderful, wonderful thing that, that, that she does. Um, 
Well, how how did you, uh, Teresa? After we we sort of talk about your fuzzy butts, we then also like to talk about your origin story. This is a perfect time to talk about that. How did you get involved with uh, uh, with Beagles and and then go on to then write about uh, your story? And I, th I think I forgot to ask you, and I, I'm not sure if you want to talk about this right now. But how is your health? How are you doing? I'm I'm good. Um, yeah that is part of my origin story and how I got to writing. Um, uh, but I'm healthy now. So we'll get, we'll, we'll ruin the ending, you know, spoiler alert. I'm healthy. Everybody lives. <laughs> it's actually there in the title of the book, but sure. um, I, uh, I had an uncle uh, when I was young um, in back in Georgia who raised beagles um, at, at the time. I didn't realize he probably because of, was the deep south probably was raising them as hunting beagles but i didn't realize that i was just visiting and beagle puppies are just like the cutest puppies in the world and i just kind of fell in love with beagles and so i had this thing from that time on that you know as soon as i could get a dog i was going to get a beagle so as soon as i graduated law school i adopted a beagle <laughs> and so i've had beagles ever since um and the the writing came about because of one very particular special beagle um, who's an, I named Seamus. So I, uh, in 2003, I guess it was, I went through a divorce and I um, moved out and moved into a condo with my two then very old beagles. And um, I was like, okay, good at a lot of things, marriage, not one of them. I'll just, uh, all I need is books and coffee and dogs and I'll be all set. And uh, college friend reminded me I was going to also need some wine and maybe a martini now and then. So we, th we threw in the A for alcohol, books, coffee, and dogs. It's all I was going to need in my life. <laughs> and within a couple of months of that, both of my beagles passed away. Hmm. So natural causes, they were both older and whatnot, but uh, I ended up going to the shelter and adopting um, a dog that I, uh, another beagle, probably mixed with Dotson. Um, and I named him Seamus because I'd just come back from a trip to Ireland and named him after one of my cousins. And I, so Seamus was kind of my dog for starting over my life. Like, okay, all these changes had gone on and I'd moved and my dogs had passed away and I'd gotten a divorce and okay, here's Seamus and I, we're going to start out new. And we had about a year before uh, the groomer, when I came and when she brought the dog, it was a mobile groomer. When she brought him back to me, to me at the front door, she said, I, I wanna show you something. And she turned him around and he had this little bump, looked like a mosquito bite on his rear end. And uh, I said, oh yeah, it looks like a bite. And she said, yeah, but it was there the last time I groomed him. And that was like six, eight weeks ago. So we, we knew it was a problem, but this was in 2004. Um, and I didn't, I don't even think I really realized dogs got cancer. Um, and I had no experience with cancer. No one in my life had ever had cancer. It just was, so I wasn't really thinking cancer um, until they told me it was cancer. And it was a mast cell tumor that he had. And because of the location, they told me that even with surgery and chemotherapy, he would last, he had maybe a year to live. And he was only like two years old at the time. And I was like, okay, I, I am done with this starting over. This, you know, no, we're going to fight this. We're going to do the surgery. We're going to do the chemotherapy. And, um, and we did. And I learned so much from that experience, mostly how resilient dogs are, how absolutely amazing dogs are. And it's never more true about how they live in the moment than when you see them go through something like that. And, uh, he beat the odds. He, a year later, he was still alive. And two years later, he was still alive. And three years later, he was still alive. When I was in the shower one morning and I shaved, shaving, and my hand brushed up against the side of my breast and I could feel, I wouldn't call it a lump. I could feel just something hardening, thickening there. And uh, went in, found out I had breast cancer. And so my journey through breast cancer was you know, I, I wouldn't call it easy, of course, but so much easier because I had already been through all of this with Seamus, primarily because they gave him such terrible odds and he beat those odds that I was kind of like, they're only odds, you know, whatever they tell me, it's only odds. Somebody beats them. I can keep going. I can do this. And a lot of the similar, there were a lot of similarities. Like we even had, Seamus and I had one of the same chemotherapies, like the same drug. Um, 
different quantities, of course, <laughs> um, but the same drug. And uh, we both had white blood cell crashes. We both had terrible first oncologists, like no bedside manner, terrible, didn't want to deal with. And I don't, and I switched doctors for Shana. Um, and I don't, and so I ended up doing the same thing for myself. And I really don't think I would have even thought to do that if I, you know, like we kind of, we get the doctor we're assigned, right? You know, they wear white coats, they're, they're the authorities. Like, what, I don't get to pick. But because I've been through it with Seamus, I was like, yes, I do. <laughs> I get to pick. I am switching doctors because this is not working for me. So um, I just learned, learned a lot from it. Um, and that's when, I, that's when I decided to write the book. I, um, I had been blogging. This is a really long answer, isn't it? <laughs> I have to take I have to take notes. My apologies yeah, for what I'm doing over here so I don't forget. I, I, I don't forget. It is a long story. But before you jump into your book, um, yeah. it's, it's such a powerful story and such a powerful, wonderful origin story. And um, um, 2004, I have to, that's just such a, an important date for me. That's yeah. when my heart dog, Malcolm, my first uh, Pyrenees, Great Pyrenees, was diagnosed with uh, bone cancer. We were in uh, Waltham, Massachusetts at the time. And just like you, I was like, um, I'm sorry, dog, dogs get cancer. And he took an yeah. x-ray of it and it's like, yeah, I'm 99% sure looking at the x-ray, it's bone cancer. And my dad was a doctor. But in 2004, most people, like you were saying, that's just, uh, I just, you, you don't think it's it's cancer. Um uh and that's just a powerful story and then and then 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 um you one of the things i wanted to 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 stop before you got into was you were mention, mentioning your your experiences uh with uh uh the, the, the I guess the first of many of your experiences with the uh, veterinary oncologist and you had a bad one ginger was telling me i guess as we were uh, prepping for the show um uh, about uh, you had an interesting name for it. ginger what was the name you, that you had for her a uh, sorority chick, wasn't it? Yeah, a doctor sorority chick. Not <laughs> just sorority chick. Yeah, you know, when we're not filming, I really want to know what her real name is. Yeah, I, 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 uh, I have, uh, I've had three dogs that have died for can from cancer, unfortunately. But by virtue of our foundation, which we fund comparative on oncology studies, and I've traveled all my travels, I've met dozens and dozens of veterinary ecologists uh, all around the country, and I know many, many more. And the vast majority of them are so wonderful. They're just so yes. great profession. But there are a few bad apples out there. And I'm at the point in, in my life where I'm 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 writing now and, and getting to, to the point where we're telling my story. And I don't know how to fictionalize it because I can't say names because or I don't want to because it's a small community. It is. But uh, yeah, yeah. It, I just gave fake names. It's unfortunate <laughs> that you did. I just wanted to stop and say it was unfortunate that you did have that experience. There are a few there are a few out there. But the rest of them are just so wonderful, and they they do have uh, wonderful beds uh, bedside uh, manners. So please continue with with this. Yeah. Story. Well, and you know, like we were saying in in two thousand and four, I want to say it was two thousand and four, two thousand and five. Seamus got cancer. A lot happened in those years, um, and there wasn't there weren't as many veterinarian oncologists, and like I had to drive a good distance to to find one. I had to be referred out and drive a good distance to find one. Um, it, there's more now. I think it's become more of a specialty, and, and maybe more competition makes everybody <laughs> raise their nice game sir. too a little. <laughs> um, yeah. So, so the book came about because when I was going through cancer, so I got diagnosed at the end of 2008. Yeah. So that means Shana's probably was 2005, and then I was 2008, and I was in treatment for most of 2009, and I got really tired of telling everybody about cancer all the time. It felt like that's all I was ever talking about. And um, I didn't want to have to keep repeating, you know, here's how I found it, here's the diagnosis, here's what's happening every time I talk to a friend or a parent or, you know, any of that. So my um, partner had suggested that I set up a blog. And again, 2009, like blog, it was kind of the heyday of blogs. Now we have podcasts, right? We had blogs then. Um, and, but I still didn't know, I like followed two blogs. I think I didn't know anything about it. We decided to set up the blog so I could just send friends and family to the blog and just say, here, you wanna know what's going on? Go there. That way, when I see you, we can talk about something other than cancer because it's kind of consuming my life and I don't want it to. Um, so I started blogging and sure, and it was really good therapy for me. 
And, you know, I would kind of process what I was going through and how I was feeling as I was typing it. And I kind of, I deal with things with dark humor. And so it would help me, you know, very much to be able to do that and go through. And then it turns out that World Wide Web really is worldwide. So it, it started being followed by a lot of people who weren't friends and family. And then it got picked up by a few magazines, women's magazines mostly, um, who wrote articles on uh, breast cancer bloggers because there seemed to be a, a little niche of us that was happening. Um, and then people started saying, you should really write a book. You should write a book. And I'm a lawyer, so lawyers write all the time. I mean, and lots of, you know, lawyers mostly love reading and writing. And I think probably 90% of lawyers out there secretly dream about writing a book. So I wasn't like writing was a strange thing for me. Um, and I certainly used to write, but I always wrote fiction. And I this was, you know, obviously would be nonfiction. And I had to think like, well, but what's, well, everything's there on the blog. What's the difference? And I realized the difference was the dog. <laughs> the difference is always the dog. Um, I hadn't talked as much about going through it with the dog and everything I had learned from the dog. So that kind of gave me the hook, as they say, too. So I, um, I started working on it and um, very quickly learned you do a nonfiction book by a proposal rather than having the whole book written. So I had to do a book proposal, which is... Um, like a business plan for a book. It's not fun <laughs> at all, but it, it's helpful. And um, the book came out. Can I show you the cover? So Absolutely. The dog, lived, the dog lived and so will I. Um, and that's actually Seamus. So you can see why we think he's probably mixed with dots in there. Yeah. Um, yep. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I gave away the ending in the book, The Dog Lived and So Will I, because people like us, dog lovers, you want to pick up a book and find out that the dog dies. So I just wanted people to know that up front. Um, so we did. And I was very happy that the publisher uh, picked it up. And then I think much to everybody's surprise, it was about six months after it came out. Um, Amazon chose it for a Kindle daily deal and did a huge blast promotion thing. So this was 2013. Takes a while to get a book out. <laughs> so 2013. And um it hit number one on the New York Times bestseller list and stayed there for a few weeks. So it was uh, my, my claim to fame and, and Seamus's claim to fame. Unfortunately, Seamus passed away from a second cancer. Um, he, he made it to when the book came out, but not when it hit number one. He passed away between those two things. So all the interviews I did when, he, when it hit number one, I cried through because he had just passed away. Like, a month before it. So he, he, but he lived to be, he was probably 12 or 13 by the time he passed away. Um, let me think, maybe, maybe 11 or 12 by the time he passed away. So not quite a full life, but certainly a lot longer than what we had originally been told. So that's my long answer on the book. <laughs> no, I, I love it because and it's so personal uh, for me, Teresa, because I'm, I'm not sure how much you know about my story. So, um, uh, I lost my first dog. So the, the one Malcolm was diagnosed with cancer, bone cancer in 2004. Um, I ended up losing him in 2006. We did an amputation and chemo. And then yeah. uh, I got on the road and I sold my truck, put my stuff in the storage. And I walked with my two Pyrenees at the time, Hudson and Murphy. Yeah. We walked from Austin to Boston. And so I got to Boston. Um, we walked over 16 states. It took over two years. And the plan was, after I did that, that we lived through that adventure. It was tremendous. We started the foundation. We met Ginger, yeah. uh, who was running the Humane Society here in Memphis. We, we She joined on and helped us along the way. And uh, so my goal was to write a book. And so I, after the walk, I went out to Colorado to work with this wonderful editor. Um, I call her Ed. Her name was uh, uh, Jeanette. Um, and, and, and so... Uh, but within a few weeks of the end of my of that walk, my other dog, the one that walked with me, Murphy, he was diagnosed with nasal adenocarcinoma. And it was just like, oh, my God, I don't know how to write this story now because I wanted to write it with like just a, a just a guy who um, was uh, an unexpected dog dad because I, I was a reluctant dog dad. I didn't want my first dog. I tried to give him away. Malcolm, a couple of yeah. times <laughs> didn't work. And uh, he changed my life. Um, and. Yeah. And so I wanted to write that that was the beginning and the end of the story. But with Murphy um, being diagnosed, I was like, I just don't know how to write the story. And we kind of put together a manuscript. So 
I know exactly how much time and how, how much heart and, 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 and love you put into it, but it is an arduous process. But um, I, I went, uh, the, the editor and the agent I was working with at the time, they put it out there in the pipeline and we got a couple, I got a couple of rejections and I'm like, look, I'm, I'm just trying to take care of my dog who was just diagnosed with cancer and I can't take rejection right now. So stop. And I just stopped it. <laughs> And so um, it, it's so wonderful that you were able to take Seamus's story and and take it from from the the the, at, the the beginning of it and and then and then bring it out to an audience. That's just I'm I'm so happy that you're able to do it and get the the, the acclaim that you did. Um, but I, you you mentioned something that I found funny is that finally a story where the dog doesn't die in the end well that's all my stories unfortunately end where the dog dies in the end and and that's the thing is that you're right that that, that people want to know that 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 survival is a process is, is a possibility with yeah. cats, right they want to they want that hope correct yeah yeah and, and and like i said you know we get these statistics and and any cancer diagnosis is horrifying right any even if they tell you oh you got the good kind you know like, like there's a good kind of cancer. It's such a weird, right. you know, but you hear that in different and, and but it's still terrifying. And you know, like I said, the odds that Seamus were, was, were given was just terrible. And, but the dog never knew that he never acted like, you know, this was it. And he, and I was so taken by the way he responded that it really genuinely helped me. And I'm not saying like you can attitude your way through cancer, obviously, but certainly you know, if you're going to have to go through it, going through it with the most positive attitude you can and staying as positive. And I am not, I'm a lawyer by nature. I'm a cynic. I'm a pessimist. You know? So it was helpful for me to have that. And that's, that's why I wanted to share the story. And also because, I don't, you know, particularly back then, people didn't really realize that cancer is a thing in dogs too. And it's getting just as rampant in dogs as it is in people because of well, everything we're doing in the environment, right? What we're feeding them and right. what we're yep. using in our households and all that kind of thing. So I, I really wanted to get the story out there. Um, if it makes you feel any better, I got some rejections on mine too, though, Luke. So we got we got some where um, the the uh, the publisher would say it's more of a cancer story and we wanted more of a dog story. And Absolutely. then we would get others where they would say, it's more of a dog story right. and we wanted more of a cancer story. And it was like, oh, this industry is so fickle. And it is, it is. Mm -hmm. And it's just what they're looking for in the market at whatever time. I, I got, the, I, I got the, we want more of the hiking story and not the dog cancer story and they would flip it and stuff. But it, it's time for me to tell the story because I've, I've gone to walk on, th to go on through two other walks, two additional walks for the two other dogs that I've lost to cancer. And I'm at that point now. It's a very important story. But I got to tell you, the other thing is that was important to me, Teresa. And and uh, I'm curious to see how, how important this was for you um, as a part of your, uh, as your, your journey. Um, throughout all of this is is um, I believe it was important for me to write an honest book an honest memoir is for me to arc there has to be me since me being the central character now I've gone through losing three dogs to cancer and now I've walked 4,250 miles for them in the most crazy circumstances and the mm -hmm. fact that I'm alive is a testament to itself of uh, that I just yeah. that love for dog but but for me to write the honest stories, I felt like that I had to change. And I felt like I struggled with being pulled back into the darkness of cancer. And I just couldn't, I don't feel like that I had changed, made that inflection point in my life. Do, does that make, make sense to you? Does that, does that? Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, yeah, because they tell you there has to be an arc to, right. there has to be a change in an arc, you know. And, and it took me a while with mine too, until I, I realized that, that as I was saying earlier, you know, by nature, I'm a pessimist and a cynic. And yet this dog had made me really this optimist through, through things. Um, I called it for a while, the reluctant op optimist, um, because I, that's just not my nature. But I had learned so much from, from the dog. And I thought his journey and mine were so, he doesn't change, right? Dogs don't change. They're like, they're always great. They're fine. They're living in the moment. They don't have a big arc. Um, and that was, that was really great for me to, to learn. So yeah, I put it in there. But I will also say that the agent, I had an excellent agent. And um, when she first read it, so the first half of the book is basically 
the dog's journey through cancer. And the second half of the book is my journey and how the dog helped me. But my agent said, well, the problem here is going to be, you know, we, we give it away in the title, the dog lived and so will I. They're going to go through this, you know, emotional journey with the dog and then know that the dog survives. What if they can't, if they just, what's going to push them to read the second? We already know that you lived and we went through cancer. And so she very astutely pulled out the romance in mind because I had started dating um, the man who's still my partner now, almost 19 years later, um, right about the same time I got Seamus. And he was not a dog person at all. So he went through the whole experience with me with Seamus. And then there was even a point in time when um, he had in one day, he had to take the dog to his oncology follow-up and me to my oncology appointment and drop everybody off and do. So we had, um, so she, she wanted that love story brought in there. And there was a lot more complication to the love story, but just to, to help with that, I don't know, the bridge between the first part and the second part. And it was like, well, thanks for telling me no one might want to read about my cancer journey after the dog, but I'll admit he's much cuter. So I guess that's what, so yeah, it's a. But that, but the, the, you're you're correct. Your your agent or your editor, I, I can't recall what you what you said, was, was very astute in in and adding that additional la layer of texture in there because it's also the power of companionship as, as yeah. well on that additional uh, level, and that you're still with your companion is equally powerful. But yeah. it's like it it changed your companion, and uh, and it's such in in. Going through uh, an experience like that, it, ma it makes a world of difference. Ginger and I have been friends um, for, uh, and, and companions in, uh, to a certain respect for, um, I don't know how many cancer dogs now, Ginger. And we, we our friendship, it's been many nine. Probably. Two of yeah. mine and several of hers. And yeah. it's just great to have a, a friend and, and to have a companion to, to lean into oh, uh, yeah. when times, yeah. times get tough. And, and it's, and it's part of the love story. It is, it's part of the love story. Yeah. Wow. Well, everybody what? has a good love story. So she it, was very smart about it. I went kicking and screaming because mm -hmm. I'm also not by nature a very romantic person. So when she was like, I need the romance in here. I need the love story. I think it's going to be meaningful to people. And, and it went with the kind of starting over theme. And I was like, yeah, nobody wants a love story for me. That's not, she was like, yes, we do. <laughs> You, she was right. So. You and I, you and I seem very wickedly similar because you have a dark <laughs> sense. You have a dark sense of humor, which I do as well. Yeah. Um, and uh, you're not the romantic type. Is, is no, I'm not at all. Uh, yeah. My tendency is to not include romance or or women and and that because to me it's it's about me and my boys. It's about right. our bond. It's our story. But you're right. The average the average person wants that um, that, that part of it. Wow, what a great story. And yeah. uh, but and then you went on after that. So to so take us after that, and then I'm sorry, unfortunately, Seamus passed throughout that process. Then what happened after Seamus? Did you adopt another beagle after that? Well, uh, yes, <laughs> keep adopting beagles. I keep foster failing. Um, I uh, so I had actually started a second book because, um, like I said, there was a six month, six to eight month period between when the first one came out and when it hit number one. It still did well, well enough that they were like, are we going to do a second book? And I thought, well, yeah, I want to do a second book um, because and I had this idea in mind, which was everything that I was going to be doing to try and prevent cancer from coming back into our lives. Because our little household was, you know, my partner and me and one dog and two out of three of us had had cancer. And I and this was before Seamus got his second battle. And so I thought, OK, I'm going to I'm going to explore this. Like, what can I do? You know, and that led to like getting all the toxic chemicals out of my house and worrying about the food that not only I was feeding me, but I was feeding him and and trying everything I possibly could. And that was my idea for the book. And I barely got started on it. And Seamus got diagnosed with a second round of cancer, totally different cancer. And ironically, uh, this was a melanoma and it was a melanoma in his eye. Only 5% of melanomas in the eye ever spread to the, ever metastasized to the rest of the body. And he was that 5%. So the first time he wasn't supposed to make it, totally made it. Second time they were like, not a problem. And he was so just the wrong side of the odds. So he passed away. And then I was like, 
well, now what do we do? Now I have the story that I tried to prevent cancer, but the dog died and so will I. Like that was my, cause I told you I'm kind of cynical. <laughs> so I was like, great. My follow-up to the dog lived and so will I is the dog died and so will I. And nobody's gonna wanna read that. Um, but I pretty quickly <laughs> adopted, uh, actually we adopted Daphne first. Um, so Daphne was a dog that um, when I was home and devastated and falling apart from Seamus, cause I really, I really did feel that way. I felt like we were so connected that whatever happened to him was gonna to happen to me. And when he passed from cancer, then I was like, okay, mine's coming back and it's all over. And any bit of optimism I had went out the window. And then I was on Facebook one day and a friend posted about this beagle in a shelter that needed a foster because she had kennel cough. She had to go somewhere where there was no other dog. And I was like, it's me. I don't have any other dogs in the house. And here's this cute beagle. She needs me and I need her. So I agreed to foster her. And we named her Daphne. And when they got to, when they brought her to my house, we could see right away, she had a big old tumor sticking out of her chest and a lump. But I knew right away what I was looking at. And we took her in and she had mast cell tumor, just like, just like Seamus. And when we did the surgery to get that lump removed, um, they discovered she had been shot. She had buckshot like all through her body. And the, the vet said she had also had many babies, um, you could tell. And so the kind of piecing things together, probably a backyard breeder, probably knew that tumor was no good, dumped her somewhere and shot her when she tried to chase after the car. Not an, not an unusual circumstance. Anyway, I ended up, of course, adopting Daphne. I was like, I am golden with this. I know what to do. I know where to take her. We're, we're taking this dog. And um, not back to Dr. Sorority chick, not back to Dr. Sorority chick. No. <laughs> um, and unfortunately, the wonderful oncologist that we had after that had moved away already. Um, she's in Colorado now. Um, but we took, we took her back to the same place, but requested a different oncologist. And Daphne lived another five years, so she was about 10, but she passed away ultimately from a second type of cancer, lymphoma. So yeah, I have um, one, two, three, four, four different cancer experiences, losing two dogs, both on the, on the second cancer. Um, but in that five years, we, that's also when we, shortly after we adopted Daphne, we adopted Percival, who I told you about earlier. So the Percival's backstory and then what we were learning about Daphne set me on a different journey. I was still on the let's get cancer out of our life journey, but I was also trying to figure out like what would be best for these two dogs, given the circumstances that they came, came from. So I learned a lot about all the things I mentioned before and getting the cancers out of our life. But I also learned about animal testing, which led me to learning about our food system and those big corporate farms and what happens to the animals and all that and uh, very quickly turned vegan because I love not just dogs but all animals and um, so the, the second book became that journey of saving these two dogs and everything I learned about these two dogs and, and what we could do to help them and help ourselves and help the planet um, is what the, the second book is about so that's this one so that's little Daphne right there <laughs> and that's about what she what she looked like from the kennel photo that they sent saying this dog needs a foster. So I don't know how you say no to that face. Right. You don't, you don't. You say no to her. And that's personal. So that's the one that came out of the laboratory. So and this yeah. is this book came out in uh, boy, how time flies, 2014. So he's only a few years old in that photo. And she's probably five or six in that photo. Like I said, he's about 12 now. So almost. So that's I the dogs were rescued. And so was I. It's a wonderful story. And uh, I want to go back to something you said, because I think it's so important. And I don't think I've ever had the occasion to discuss this at, at this level or to this extent, is that you were talking about how cancer, you, you know, you, you really is just a sad story. It's just going to be a sad ending, you know, and uh, we, we uh, never really get to talk about that that and i think it's something that you've had to learn in your own personal part is that no one you never get to say the tough part that no one and i see all the social media posts of of, of the, the the pet owners there the dog owners that that they say oh hey buddy we got the got the got the bill in we're buddy now is cancer free well the sad 
truth is that we don't really want to talk about is once you get the cancer diagnosis, you, you can never say that you're you can never say you're you're cancer free because we don't know that you got everything, and more importantly, right. we don't know mm -hmm. that if it spread somewhere else into something else. And that's very true of dogs because dogs are typically uh, very advanced um, when uh, when at the point of diagnosis. Um, so it's just something that that's tough that I think that you've learned that it's just, it's, it's a sad story. And the other thing that I've learned, because I talked to so many pet parents, they always ask me, well, you know, and, and, and also talking about, well, well, how are you going to tell the story? How are, how are dogs getting cancer? What have you learned? And, and I, and I always have to say, well, the truth is we're killing ourselves. We gave mm -hmm. cancer to ourselves and we gave cancer to our dogs. I right. don't know what you want me to tell you other than that. Somewhere downstream, or I guess you should say upstream, a long time ago, we started putting it into the environment in a big way. And so we're now seeing the after effects that, you know, the numbers in, hu in humans um, are, are higher. The actual, the incidence of cancer in humans is actually increasing, but our survival rate is increasing. That's the good thing. And that's what we're managed, we're, we're, we're doing now is we're really managing cancer. Um, yeah. Going back to a guest we had recently, recently on, Jaime uh, Modiano, Modiano, he said it, I think, beautifully. It's like, he said, I want to get to a point where pet parents no longer fear cancer. And I thought, wow, that's really well said because he's not trying to give unrealistic ex expectations, but he just want, doesn't want uh, people to think that he wants it to people to feel that this is something that we can manage and we could, we could hopefully have a good, uh, good long-term outcome. Right. 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 Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, even, even with humans, with me, they don't ever say, you know, you're cured about the cancer. Um, I had a particularly aggressive breast cancer. I had triple negative breast cancer, which has one of the highest rates of recurrence quickly. And it, as they said to me then, if it comes back, it'll kill you. Thanks. Um, yeah, um, they're not real delicate in their language. No, <laughs> but, they're not. Um, but, uh, I, they were trying to convince me to do chemotherapy. I didn't need convincing, but I understood it and I was going to do it, but I think they're used to having to convince people. <laughs> But at any rate, they don't say you're cured. They don't, they, they'll say remission and they'll say NED, no evidence of disease. So that's all they can say is there's no evidence of disease right now, but um, they don't say cured or any of that. And I'm sure it's the same with the dogs. I didn't hear it put NED. Um, I, maybe I did with Seamus actually, because I think they were, I think they were pretty convinced it was going to come back and it, it didn't, not that one, not that type of cancer. So. Right. They, they are actually, I, I think um, they are actually changing the terminology in veterinary medicine. I do think, I, I do think they're, they talk about managing out, managing outcomes or managing yeah. disease a little bit more. And they, they talk about it, I think a little bit more realistically, but I think, I don't know about you and I don't know about other people, but I can handle, I guess, human cancer and human disease but when it comes to, to our fuzzy yeah. butts that are in, in get any type of disease or in any way hurting or or that I don't handle that very or abused, I don't Truly. handle it very Truly. well. I yeah. I I too uh, was a was a was a foster fail my first one, so I'm zero for one. Uh, yeah. with Grayson and he came from an abuse situation in which he lost his uh, uh what his hind leg, and yeah. uh, so he has after effects for that. So I. I feel for that, and but uh, I, I told the uh, the rescue, the wonderful uh, great uh, great Pyrene National Great Pyrenees Rescue. Uh, mm -hmm. I told them they they're like they're so, they started to tell me the story. I'm like, don't tell me the story because I will hunt them down and probably hurt them. So yeah, um, yeah, it, great. I'm I'm here in Paso Robles, which is Central California um, wine country. And Great Pyrenees are very popular here. They're vineyard dogs. So everybody has them in their vineyards protecting. And so you see a lot of Great Pyrenees around here. Unfortunately, you see a lot of them get lost too because yeah. they're just out in lots of property and whatnot. So um, you, they're beautiful dogs though. I love them. So. They are. Oh. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. You're, you're, you're in perfect company in that regard. I, I somehow I ended up, ended up with Great Pyrenees but I think my next one's going to be a doxa. So oh, really? <laughs> I love your doxy mix. I just, I like you, I see a doxy face and I fall in love. <laughs> yeah. yeah I've, had three, I've had three doxins and they are something else. Yeah. 
Yeah, there. My dad has a Datsun right now, and he's Monty is his name. He's hilarious. Yeah, that they're very similar to beagles, but personality wise, yeah. Oh yeah, they have one. small dog, big personality. Yeah. And sorry, I if I seem distracted, my 15 and a half year old dog, who never really likes to be petted, has been pacing. You could see her. I can see him. Yeah. Saw, yep. Yeah. <laughs> he was going back and forth, and yep. she's pawing at me, and and. It's time. <laughs> and yeah. She's like, she's been out. She's been fed. She's been. Oh, I was going to say, is it dinner time? Yeah. That's no, I, I fed before, before the podcast. So, and she was out, but she, um, she also has cancer. We're going to oh. say there's no evidence of disease at this point, okay. but um, she's 15 and a half and she gets whatever she wants. Yeah, sure. So. Sure. Yeah mine get whatever they want and even the 5 12 and 14 year old they all still get whatever they want. yeah well pr pretty much but she rules the house and um yeah. luke was saying something the other day that she gets a hundred percent and all the other dogs get 80 <laughs> yeah. yeah yeah it's the way it's the way it should be yeah. um so all of your all of your kids were rescues correct yeah yeah yeah, that, that's wonderful. Do you work with uh, uh, other rescues as well? I kind of wanted to talk about this, uh, take this opportunity to talk about the importance of rescuing. So everyone out there, I know yeah. I'm a great Pyrenees guy, but all of mine, my first two were gifts for me. Um, there's Lily. Mm -hmm. Hey, we have a fuzzy butt on Fuzzy Butts and Friends. If you're watching this on our YouTube channel at uh, fuzzybuttstudios.com. That's the, that's, that's the matriarch of the Morgan Manor. Wow, that's perfectly oh. or the the madam. You may call it the madam. Exactly. The yeah. Of the Morgan Manor. She uh and I and I, and I, I must say, because uh, I, I do love talking about all the kids. Ginger has lots of kids. I just have two, but I gotta say my two Pyrenees, when they're down um with Ginger, with, with you near know, Lily, they give her the respect that she's earned. So it's fascinating. Um, since we're talking about dogs. And you have more. You have three right now, Carl. Three right now. Isn't yeah. it fascinating the hierarchy and and uh, just and it's and even though you know, like I said, I've always had beagles. Um, well, not when I was a kid. I had a cockapoo, um, but it, pretty much since then, it's always been beagles. But they all of them have such distinct personalities, and then the way the three or two or whatever the mix is changes everything. Right now, the queen of our household is Poppy. She's the five-year-old, and she's she is the quintessential little sister. Like they both adore her, and she can do no wrong. She can step on them, she can climb over them, she can take their food, she can do anything. And they're like, "Okay, you're cute." We're kind of the same way with her. But the two boys together don't don't give each other much slack at all. But her, they're like the the boys are like that. You know, mom touching me if they get <laughs> but her she can climb up on their head and sit and they're like okay you know it's, it's yeah. hilarious to see so they're they're fun I've had, I'm on my fifth Pyrenees and I, I swear to God, every one of my Pyrenees represented one facet of my personality, accentuated times 10. And yes, I, like, yes. I, I don't know if that's, I'm just cursed with Pyrenees and they're just, somehow I'm in a simulation and I just- Maybe the personalities, them. you're attracted <laughs> to them because the personalities match, you know? Exactly. Well, I thought <laughs> when I first met Luke and Hudson and Murphy- I was like, oh my gosh, these dogs are just like him. They're stubborn as they could possibly be. And then I started doing a little bit of research on Great Pyrenees. And I was like, oh no, that's just the way they are. They're like <laughs> dachshunds in a big drawn. body. Yeah. Right. I'm like, um, oh my gosh. So I want to say in, in 2013, um, it could have been 2012, but I think in 2013, I was at one of your puppy up walks. I, I think it was in Huntington Beach in California. Yeah. That yes. was and I yeah. either talked or I did something, but I was there because Ginger and I had connected before. Mm -hmm. So Luke, am I remembering correctly? Did you just have really long hair? I yes. did, yes. Did. Yeah. Okay. So see you have that Pyrenees, great Pyrenees thing too. You have the long yeah. hair. Yeah, I I, I I used to not have gray in my beard or even gray in my hair, but but the beard came first, but I I I told people that I've actually backpacked 4,250 miles 
and 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 over that that long length of those many many miles i have i've turned pyrenees i'm turning pyrenees i'm devolving you'll see by the time i'm maybe 60s mid 60s maybe 70s i'll be on all fours and then you know, yeah. i'll just grow up with my pyrenees in the wilderness wilderness you start drooling yeah. yep <laughs> so teresa was luke luke was at that walk at huntington beach i was he I don't think so. I think I just okay. remember seeing the posters and the signs and kids. I don't know when you started Puppy Up, but I felt like I found out about it pretty quickly and I got in touch because I had this book coming out about dog. dog right. Books. It was uh, right around then because I was looking back and it looked like you were going to try to stop at one of our other walks on your yeah. book tour because you were going to be close to that. But I don't think that you would, that yeah, did, you somewhere wouldn't in make it. Because yeah. I was on right. tour in the Midwest too. Yeah, it was yeah. in um, yeah. Liberty... Liberty, Can uh, yeah, Kansas. Kansas, Kansas, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I was there, yeah, and I, um, I went to the Huntington Beach. Well, maybe I was just went to just see what was going on, and, and yeah. But I do remember Seamus was with me, so he mm -hmm. went to a puppy up. He huh? got to yeah. be a part of puppy up. That's wonderful. Seamus is part of our history. That's wonderful. Yeah. Well, yeah. I back I backpacked the entire length of the West Coast from Canada to Mexico, and so oh I God. walked right through Huntington Beach. And Ginger, what was our, our volunteer there that unfortunately she moved and 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 was no longer able to do the walk there anymore? What was her name? Uh, if, you, if you had asked me that five yeah. seconds ago, I could yes. have. I met I met thousands. Her dog's thousands name was Bud. Was Bud. And, and Ginger Lori. will remember it five seconds after he stops recording as well. Exactly. It'll come yes. right back to you. Yeah. But you know what? Her walk, her yeah. heart dog that she lost to cancer's name was Bud, a golden retriever. Yep, yep. Uh, yeah. yeah. So. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful area in California. But uh, yeah. my, my God, walking on the PCH, I didn't do the, the PCT. I, I walked on the PC, PCH the entire yeah. time. And it was uh, treacherous, but but beautiful beautiful yeah beautiful uh uh country well you also Teresa, you've also Lori ekman Lori ekman. Right, Lori ekman yep 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 that's it it came to me um, but i just had to check to make sure i was right because the la her last name sounds like somebody else's so she yeah. was so hospitable and so uh just just really just a beautiful part of the, the puppy up family um so Teresa, you've also uh, done more than two books you've also done several more let's go right. ahead and hear those and plug those too so, uh, well, one more. Um, yeah, so I, I jokingly say that I write about tragedies that happen to me and my dogs. And um, so the third book is Poppy's book. Um, so that is, Poppy so you can see she's, she's not the purebred yeah. beagle. Um, but you don't really see Pekingese or Shih Tzu in her either, I don't think. No, I don't either. delicate paws I... and maybe her eyes, but... So it's Poppy in the Wild, a lost dog, 1,500 acres of wilderness, and the dogged determination that brought her home. So what happened to our cute little Poppy is we, we were fostering her for Beagle Freedom Project, and she went to a potential adopter for an overnight stay, for a trial period and an overnight stay. They took her outside um, to do her business. And a thunderstorm broke out and she got frightened and somehow twisted out of her harness and ran. And she ran across a very busy intersection in the middle of, you know, the worst traffic into a shopping center, raced around there, back across the intersection and ended up running into a 1500 acre wilderness park in the middle of a thunderstorm. And uh, they, the people who were going to adopt her um, texted me. We were at a Lakers game. A client had given my partner, Chris, will never forget this part. A client had given me tickets to a Lakers game and we were we were on the court right right behind the Lakers and we got a text and I was like, we got to go. We're out of here. We're not staying for this game. And he was like, can I watch the tip off? I was like, if it happens in the next two minutes, but we're out of here, we got to go get this dog. And we left, we got back and um, basically spent the next uh, 12 to 18 hours doing everything that you're not supposed to do when your dog goes missing. We did everything wrong. And I had no idea we were doing it wrong. Um, we, you know, went out searching for her, went out calling for her, went and, you know, sent, got people to go out into the wilderness park in the middle of a storm, in the middle of the night, calling to her and trying to find her. And uh, the next day, back out there doing the same thing. And somebody said, you need to call, um, Mike Noon. And I was like, I, who's Mike Noon? 
and they said he's a pet rescue spe or pet gosh why can't I remember the name it's not rescue um recovery pet recovery specialist not a pet detective they do not like that term um, <laughs> and I was like I don't know what that is but I'll try and call him and the call didn't go through and then somebody said you need to call Babs Fry and I was like who is she pet recovery specialist okay Am I the only person who doesn't know what a pet recovery specialist is? So I called and make a long story less long because all my answers have been long. <laughs> there are people who specialize in telling you what to do to find your lost dog under the circumstances that your dog gets lost in, particular to your dog, the location and everything else. And for us, we had done everything wrong because one, Poppy's afraid of people. So sending a bunch of strangers out there was going to just send her further underground. Um, Two, it, it was raining and we were spreading, you know, scents everywhere and there was no, it was going to be too difficult for her to find her way back to a spot. And they just, and then they looked at the um, map of the wilderness park where she was lost to figure out the most likely spot that she would go. And they figured out this one little like cul-de-sac area that it was surrounded by nice houses and, but it was a cul-de-sac basically. And then this was the wilderness and these were houses. So they said she was likely to end up there because she could pop into houses for food because humans are messy and we leave food and water and whatnot around. She could pop in and out of the houses and then also keep her back protected. So she only had to, and they were absolutely right. And it took us five and a half days, wow. but we finally they, they, they were spot. They were spot on? They were spot on, everything wow. they told us. And then the idea is to not chase her to get enough sightings that you can kind of map it out eventually figure out their pattern because they will settle into a pattern and set a unique trap and i was so impressed with everything they did and i felt like i'm a person who knows a pretty good amount about dogs i spend a lot of my time with them i work with a lot of rescues i do legal work for a lot of rescues i was like and i had no idea so I really wanted to get the word out. And I kept saying to, and I worked with both of them, Mike and Babs. They turned out to be friends anyway. Um, and by the way, I never met them in person. They did it all by phone and internet by looking at the maps. And I kept saying, God, you guys really need to write a book because this is amazing. Wow. People need to know this. Yeah. And finally, Mike looked at me and he was like, lady, I don't write books. I find dogs. And I was like, <laughs> right, right. I write books. <laughs> So I said to Chris at the time, like, if this has a happy ending, I have my next dog tragedy with a happy ending because, I mean, what kind of a book would it be? If right. it ended? And we never found her. Um, so, yeah, we found her and obviously adopted her as well. So yet another foster fail. <laughs> so you took Chris, who originally didn't like dogs. Right. Got him tickets to the Lakers game and then made him leave, leave the Lakers game to go find a dog. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. He's a big dog lover now. And it's yeah. funny. People, people <laughs> the first book, yeah. they'll be like, you know, because I mentioned it and he's not a dog person. He was not a dog. Right. Person. Yeah. You know, and people will still to this day be like, I thought he wasn't a dog person. And he's always <laughs> like, that was 13 years ago. <laughs> like, I like dog or 18 years ago you know he likes dogs now and he's personal <laughs> he is like they're like this so that's his dog so just ask personal <laughs> so, um yeah I, lo I love that I, it's such a wonderful story ginger we need to get uh um a, a pet recovery expert or specialist on the show um or pet detective and then we I, I, we great would you be comfortable maybe making that connection um with the, yeah, absolutely. the people that yeah. uh, um, saved poppy found poppy that'd be a great um way to dovetail and, and connect these two stories together yeah I, 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 can, I can connect you to to both of them um Babs okay. it's down in San Diego she does a, a lot of um press and and talk and whatnot and okay. I should also mention both of them work for free um wow. Babs has yeah it's amazing Babs has a foundation that she'll ask you to make a donation to if you sure. feel like it but it's not required she's just out there doing it for the dogs and she has they both have amazing success rates and finding as long as you listen to them like if you don't listen to them and you're still trying to do the things they're telling you not to do, they're pretty much done with you. They're moving on to finding the next dog, but they are amazing. And it's, it's, it's a science. I mean, it's, it's fascinating because we did have like when Poppy was missing and we had signs up everywhere, 
you know, I did get contacted by um, psychics um, and different things like that. It would have just like, you're tying up my phone line. I, I really need, you know, right. real calls because it would be things like, I see orange, she's near somewhere orange. Well, she was lost in Riverside, which is like the citrus capital and there's orange trees everywhere. And every street <laughs> is named after a citrus, it's orange, lime, lemon, you know, it was like, well, that's it's not gonna be helpful. It's like telling me you see blue and the sky counts, you know, yeah. like she's somewhere under the sky. <laughs> so we had a lot of that. But that's not what they were. These pet recovery specialists are amazing. Well, I, you know, I, I surprised I'd never heard of them because one of my biggest fears be backpacking for so many miles and, and a number of times my, my kids got loose. Um, yeah. Uh, one time got out of the tent. Uh, uh, the, anyway, they just got off loose off the, the leash and or got loose. And uh, yeah, I just terrified me being out on the road, not being able to need not having any resources to be able to find them. Fortunately, now, though, they actually do have GPS, pretty advanced GPS systems, though, um, for people. That Poppy are... was wearing one when she got Wow. Lost. Did it not but work? Here's the problem. Yeah, go ahead. Please. Here's the problem with them. So they wear the GPS, and it's an app on your phone. So when they contacted me at the Lakers game, I went to the app on the phone, and I could press it and see through the set where she was. So I could tell them where she was, which is also how we knew she had run into the wilderness park. Okay. Um, but the more you use it to see where they are, the more you run the battery down. So her battery ran out, well, the battery on the GPS ran out somewhere around one o'clock in the morning. She got lost about 530 and the battery was dead by one in the morning. So all we knew was at some point she had run into the middle of the wilderness park and then the battery died and we didn't know like, and it, so it never moved. So it was like, did the battery die? Did she die? Did yeah. the collar come off? What wow. happened? Yeah. No, that, that's heart wrenching. Uh, but fortunately, it had a happy ending. But I know we actually had a GPS system um, for Indiana and Hudson on the West Coast Walk. And the limitation to their technology was it only just took snapshots, like at a particular time of where they were at that location. It wasn't continuous location, real time. And yeah, because like, that would use up too much battery. Exa yeah. Exactly. But it's like, yes, but dogs don't, they don't, they're not set in they tune. They're, gonna, they're <laughs> not going to sit around and wait and yeah. wait for you. But technology has, has, of course, has its limitations. Well, I mean, it's clear that you've written so, it's obvious why you've written so many uh, wonderful <laughs> books, Teresa. You've got so many great, robust, beautiful uh, stories that have had both happiness um, ha still have happy endings and unfortunately a few sad endings as well. So uh, we've taken up so much of your time, but as we wrap it down, are there any more of the stories you'd like to share with the uh, pet parents or audience out there? I, I will just tell everybody that, that Roe and Percival and Poppy are all ha happy and healthy. And I am hoping no more tragedies, even if it means no more dog books. I'm okay with that if it means no more tragedies. <laughs> I have a return to writing fiction. So I hope that eventually I'll um, finish up this manuscript I've been working on. And of course there's a dog involved in it, but it is fiction and I, I am enjoying it because I can, it, it's not real people or real animals. I would never even let a fictional animal get hurt, to be honest. But <laughs> I can control it more, so I'm I'm back to fiction writing. So we'll we'll see. Good for you. I, I understand that. Actually, I realized um, I did my first walk in 2008 to 2010. Um, and then um, I did one in 2014 after my second one died from cancer. And then I didn't do a single walk into 2022. And then I realized that big gap is like, wow, I haven't been on the road for a long time, but I realized I didn't have a dog with cancer. So um, I enjoyed the time off the road, but it was for good reason. So I hope you're uh, all row, Percival, um, and uh, yeah, Poppy. And Poppy. I, I, I wasn't sure. I, I was going to say Pippi for a second. I looked at my handwriting, and of course, I hate <laughs> my handwriting. It's horrible. Poppy, continue, I wish them continued good health and good health. Uh, good outcomes hey. with their with their situation and you you as well so how is now that everyone knows your knows your story um how is your health how are you doing so my health is fine i am ned no evidence of disease um i did have we had to postpone this because i had gallstones and pancreatitis starting on easter so i was in the hospital for a few days but as far as we know unrelated to the cancer right. just one of those 
weird little fluky thing. So sorry we had to reschedule, but glad we did at least get to talk. So yeah, so am I. Would have had to do this from like a hospital bed before. So. Absolutely. Yeah, I, you know, I'm. I like to keep people to the schedule, but not for the not hospital. that much. Yeah, yeah not that much. I'm not hate having to slide. reschedule stuff because I know how it is to try and do this. But I was like, I feel like this is in everybody's best interest. <laughs> <laughs> I did want to, I did look at my notes. I just took one good, quick good glance and I saw that I'd circled one thing that I missed and uh, wanted to talk about real quickly was um, I'm, I'm sure you did research in your research. Did you learn that, you know, dogs are, are such a good model for understanding cancer in people. And that's the type yeah. of studies that um, our foundation funds comparative oncology and breast cancer in particular is a good one. We funded a study um, and that was uh, Princeton in collaboration with UPenn looking yeah. at genetic yeah. markers. And so one thing that we learned is that uh, breast cancer in our canine companions not only looks the same underneath the mi microscope, it acts and then spreads the same as breast yeah. cancer in women. So if you think about the power of, of your companion with your dogs, you know, I, I personally think and believe that dogs will, will give us, will, I won't say the answer to cancer, but I think we'll gain a much significant and better understanding of cancer. Our partnerships Absolutely. with our, our companion animals, with our with our canine companions is much more powerful yet that we don't understand yet. Yeah, absolutely. Like they don't do enough for us, right? Then they're, they're going to solve cancer. And they're going to save us too. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. But I, I, I believe that too. Yeah, and I, and. I think one day they they will find the cause or at least the prevention of it, and I'm sure dogs will help that. Um, yeah. I know they help us through treatment. That's for darn sure. So they, they do, they do, and, and like like uh, Seamus did for you, they certainly give us uh, um, a, a, a better hope and a more optimistic view of of life, and and not only life but also the transience of life and and the necessity and imperativeness and imperativeness to value it pretty much every day so uh, yeah. um, on, on that note we won't keep you any longer um from poppy and percival and ro get back to your fuzzy butts thank you so much yeah, for time. <laughs> where can our audience Teresa? where can they find you on social media and more importantly find your books um, so books are wherever books are sold. Sure. Um, there, the Poppy in the Wild is probably still in bookstores, um, like physical bookstores, but the other two are a little bit older. So they're mostly on the Amazon or bookshop.org. I always like saying bookshop.org because it supports the indie bookstores um, rather than the giant conglomerate. <laughs> um, so yeah, you can get any of them there. On social media, I'm pretty much at Teresa Ryan on any Twitter, Facebook, um, except Instagram, you have to use my middle initial, Teresa J. Ryan. Um, okay. If you want a lot of cute legal pictures, Instagram is the place to find me. <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll link to that in our show notes, your social media contact. Um, and for those that are listening to it, it's without an H. So it's T-E-R-E-S-A-R-H-Y-N-E. Yeah, we take the H out of Teresa and stick it in Ryan. So. You know, that, that, that's very, that's very, that a writer would think like that. So you clearly yeah. are, you have the mind of a writer. Well, thank you very much, Teresa Ryan. You thank you. Carrie, both. This was great. Your wonderful, your wonderful books. Um, before we go, Ginger, um, I, I do, did I screw anything up uh, this time or did I leave anything out? Uh, no, not that I know of. No, I think you've, you caught everything. Did you want to do a, a cancer tip of the week other than breast cancer? Uh, what would you like to do? What I was going to do um, was talk about the lumps and bumps and, and always looking and petting your dog and pet them sometimes, you know, at least once or twice a month with a purpose, you know, feel all over them in their armpits, behind their ears, between their toes, check their behinds. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, the, the groomer, if your dog is one that goes to the groomer, ask your groomer to tell you if they feel anything strange or different. Um, I will say that Hudson's groomer actually found a lumpy bump on him that I would not have felt because it was more, instead of it being like a pea size or something, it was more rounded, like it was a mound of something. And if you weren't 
feeling actually both sides, you wouldn't, you wouldn't notice a difference in yeah. it. So um, the groomers are really, you know, they, they, they feel everything they, they've got, they, they are there, they see it all the, they're looking in their ears. So don't miss anything and um, pay attention to it. And if it gets, it grows or it doesn't go away, go to your vet to get a fine needle aspirate. They're like attorneys for dogs. They look at all their briefs and all their, uh, <laughs> all their <laughs> private cards. Um, and also I wanted to add to, to uh, that as well, um, to, to breast cancer. Um, your point was lumps and bumps, right? Mine was lumps and bumps, yes. And well, you can find lumps and bumps in breasts as well, obviously. Although yeah. I, I, if I can just add to that, sure. um, mine did not feel like a lump or a bump. It just felt oh. like something thickening in there. See, um, and that was that was Hudson's. Um, yeah. And Hudson, just looking for it was a, a thickening. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, something that was yeah. different. That's what you want checked out? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and also, and also, Ginger, I wanted to ask you the question. Um, the, the question is, what is the current thinking? Do we know the current thinking about spaying and spaying uh, and the, its link to breast cancer? Last time I talked to uh, someone um, of an authoritative nature um, about that, that they're still thinking that 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 a, do a female dog should have its first heat before you spay it, you spay it. Um, to minimize uh, the risk of br breast cancer. Is that accurate? Do you know? Um, I may yeah. be wrong on that. Uh, so please, if, if I am, please uh, reach out to me, let me know, and correct me. But what, what do we know about that right now? So I don't know if they have to go through a heat cycle before they're spayed, you know, but for many reasons, we've learned that you should spay and neuter your dogs at a later at a later age, let them get at least to be 12 months old. But I do know that if they're not, if the female is not spayed later in life, they're, uh, they are more susceptible to getting uh, breast cancer. Right. Or mammary so, tumors. So if you have, if you have a young female uh, puppy, uh, get out there, do your research, do your own research. And also it makes sense to, for you to already establish a, a rapport. You have a vet that has a relationship with a veterinary oncologist and find out what the latest thinking is um, on that. So that's the Puppy Up Foundation's Cancer Tip of the Week. Uh, once again, Teresa, thank you so much for being here on Fuzzy Butts and Friends. Thank you. All yeah, right, everybody, you thank you thank for you. listening us, to us. You can find us on YouTube at FuzzyButtStudios.com or on iHeartRadio and uh, Spotify, Fuzzy Butts and Friends. We'll see you next week. Pop you up. Talk soon.